Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our second webinar of this um, biological webinar series. Just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, everybody is muted. If you have questions, you can type them into the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of our uh, presenter's presentation. So with that, uh, Keith, would you like to introduce our presenter today? Yep, sure will, Dylan. Thank you. And thank you for your help in organizing all this. Folks, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Jay Young uh, from Western Kansas. Jay is one of our favorite people to work with because he is just a bundle of energy, a bundle of passion around everything that he does, but in particular, soil health and regenerative agriculture. Uh, you'll find very few people who combine both the knowledge of what he's doing because he's doing it on his own farm. This isn't theoretical stuff. What he's going to be telling you is things that he's done on his own operation. So it's real stuff. So combining that knowledge and experience with, with the passion and the enthusiasm that, that you will see uh, come out of him. So we've known Jay for many years. I've worked with him on seed and stuff uh, across the years. And, and now we are uh, excited to be able to be a sponsor of his YouTube channel, which he'll be talking about. Uh, and I may even be sharing some of the links of some of the videos that he mentions off of his YouTube channel. If you aren't subscribed to his channel, please go do that because he puts out great content. If you're not subscribed to the Green Cover channel, we would encourage you to do that as well. Uh, so Jay is going to be talking about kind of all things soil health and regenerative agriculture, but specifically around the Johnson Sioux uh, composting method because this is a great place for people to start because it's something you can do yourself on your own operation. So Jay, we're excited to have you. Uh, we appreciate you being part of our webinar series and I'm going to let you take it away from here, buddy. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. I'm going to get my screen up here. Um, thought that was the right screen. Let's get... Okay, can you see that, guys? Yes. Perfect. All right, so um, I'm a lot of what I'm covering has been covered in presentations or on my YouTube channel, but I added some stuff in there in the end because I, I feel like the biggest takeaway that for you guys is the opportunity there is um, within Johnson Sioux, not only to save money, but to also have a, a second uh, income source uh, on your farm. So I wanted to make sure that I added something to this presentation that hasn't been seen before uh, from my YouTube channel or from uh, or from any one of my presentations. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, we'll, we'll get rolling here. Um, I started uh, in with with in the cover crop or understanding cover crops in 2016. So before that, um, in 2015, I, I farmed eight quarters of ground that I rented from my granddad. And then I was a full-time employee uh, working for my dad and for my granddad. And uh, we didn't do any cover crops. I had no cows um, and we would run stalkers and our rotations were pretty much wheat, corn, fallow or wheat, corn, milo. And I, all eight quarters that I had were no-till. And it was around that time that dad was transitioning out of no-till because the cost of killing weeds was so expensive. And so I was, um, even though it was costing me a lot of money, I wanted to stay no-till because I just, I thought that that made sense, even though I really didn't understand the full depths of why no-till was so important. So in 2016, I was at a friend's house and uh, his daughter was talking about what she was learning in college about cover crops. And I said, what's a cover crop? My friend was shocked and astonished and offended that I did not know what a cover crop was. So instead of playing card games that night, which was what I thought I was at his house to do, we watched a hour long video on uh, grazing cattle on cover crops. And that was a pivotal moment, uh, I'd say, in my life, because I, uh, I've always wanted to raise cattle and uh like a cow calf operation because i i love the stalkers more than i love farming um on my own operation and so i uh when i watched that video i was hooked i was like man I've, i'm gonna figure out how to do this and so i took a lot of time and and studied and i, I guess i say a lot of time it was a full month before i i presented to my dad that i was gonna run 
cow-calf operation on cover crop. So that started in 2016. Um, I bought my first cover crop in April of 2016 from Green Cover Seeds. I talked to Brett Pleschke and and Brett helped me put that together. Um, and that's kind of where we went from, from there. So in 2022, um, or I guess now it's 2023, I'm thrown off by the year, year, even though I'm six months into it. We have 140 cows, uh, 30 bred heifers, 80 replacement heifers, and we're running 155 steers. And uh, we'll have a bull sale on March 30th, um, and we'll sell roughly about 35 bulls. Um, I bought into my granite's half of Young and Son, and um, most we're pretty much no-till on everything we do. We had three quarters of ground that we did sweep, but everything else is is getting no to or is is the no-till. And with biologicals, most of our acres are are getting cover crops in in some way, shape, or form. So the shift for me, like I, I had that, that journey where I was doing cover crops, um, you know, and then that was the biggest, the, the, the beginning to my mind shift change. And so I got into cover crops, but as I, I went down that journey, um, I have dyslexia. And so reading is tough. And um, for most of my life, I've kind of seen myself as someone who, if I'm in a room of people the majority of people in this room are probably smarter than me. Um, and that's, you know, just came from not getting good grades in school, not scoring well on the SAT and just having issues learning. And it was more of an issue of not knowing the best way for me to learn. But because of, of, of that happening to me, um, I, it took me a long time for, I, I had a paradigm shift in my, my learning processes. And so in, when I found out about cover crops, I was all in on the cover crop aspect of it, but just to raise cattle, the, the science of it really uh, held me back from, from really being able to go the way that I needed to go as far as the regenerative agricultural path, because you have to understand the biology, in my opinion, to really be able to utilize and to understand what you're doing um, with regenerative agriculture and with healing your soils. So uh, I was at a conference and Dr. Christine Jones said that if you don't eliminate phosphorus from your op operation, you'll never get where you need to go um, because phosphorus hinders root exudate development. Root exudates uh, are necessary in building aggregates. And if you don't have aggregates, you don't have soil structure. You can't have a water cycle. You can't do all these things. So I raised my hand and I, I, and I kind of regurgitated what I thought she was saying and she confirmed what I just said. And, and so I realized that I was in a lot of trouble because my dad was in any kind of position where he was excited about eliminating phosphorus from the operation. I didn't know how to do it because even though we were doing cover crops, because of how dry our environment is, it's a long process in healing the destruction of tillage and the, the, the detrimental things that we've been doing in agriculture. And it's not in Western Kansas, it's not like other areas where you get a, a ton of rain and you can heal the system quickly because it's raining. You know, we have long dry periods and that those dry periods are, are killing the biology that's that's in your soil. And then years of tillage is keeping, you know, that biology held back. And so when I heard that, I realized I, I had to make a change. And so it was almost a perfect timing because I'm pretty sure she was in the same it was the same conference she was at that Dr. Johnson was talking about the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. So when I heard him speak of the Johnson Sioux bioreactor and he talked about how they'd reduced nitrogen inputs for this farm. And I later found out that this farm is located in Turkey, but they, they reduced their nitrogen by 85% and eliminated FOSS. And they were the most profitable, you know, in that system of cutting back to 15% of, of nitrogen use and no phosphorus. And so I was, I was, I was sold. I thought he was crazy. I didn't think there was any way that would work, but I was sold. And so anyway, I, uh, I was all in on wanting to build these Johnson Sioux bioreactors. So before I kind of get into that, the Johnson Sioux bioreactor is a fungally dominant compost from what I've seen, I, I haven't had anybody or or found anybody that boasts of a more fungally dominant compost than Johnson Sioux. The reason it <clears throat> is so fungally dominant is because it takes a year to make. Um, but what it is, is I'm going to skip forward real quick. 
you make this bioreactor that you see on the screen here and uh, you fill it full of, you know, a, primarily a carbon based product. But I, I have found that it's good to mix and have greens and carbon in there. Just you want a higher carbon source and you want nitrogen source, but you fill it full. And then once it's full in a year, it breaks down into fungally dominant compost. And so I've, I've got YouTube videos that show the building of this process. Um, and then I talk about the ingredients and why your ingredients matter. And so I'll make sure Keith gets the videos I think are, are pertinent to you viewers who are watching this. So you, if you are new to Johnson Sue, then you know, um, it's, it's just too much information to get in on this webinar. And, you know, for the guys who have been doing it, I want to get the information to them that, um, that would help them because I, I think if you've been doing Johnson Sue, there's some real opportunities there um for you to to grow as a as a business um and have a, extra revenue streams on your farm so um we're going to move on here this is what it looks like when you're building it um and this is how we build it dr johnson builds it slightly different so if you want if you're a gardener or you don't have the opportunity to build it this way um there's opportunity for you to be able to 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 build johnson sue the way that they did but this is how we do it you take the shell off of an IBC tote, uh, you line that shell with weed barrier mat, and then you want to evenly space the PVC pipes in there. It's kind of hard to see with the way our, our webinar series is, but you have five PVC pipes in there, and that evenly spaces the pipes so that you have airflow going all the way through. That's the key to these this this um, compost because you have airflow going through uh, the entire time, and you never have it go anaerobic because of the airflow. So you wet your, your ingredients and you put them inside this bioreactor. That's what the bottoms look like. So the air gets through. And so you can see on the right, that's, or the left, that's a full um, Johnson Sioux bioreactor that we just filled. Um, and that's, that's right after it's been filled. So the next day we would go back out and we would pull those pipes out and then the, the iteration that, that we've come up with, and I I'm, it's been a while since I've been doing this. I think I came up with this idea, but it's possible somebody else had this idea. I can't really remember, nor do I care. But the, the you can break these sections apart, and you know, once it's broken apart, you can see on the right that you know it as it breaks down, it's easier to access the compost. And I I really like doing it that way because I like having good access to the compost. And so the left shows you what it looks like when it's right when you fill it in there. That one's the corn stalks. Uh, grass clippings, wood chips, um, horse manure, and um, yeah, that, that, those four corn stalks, grass clippings, uh, uh, wood chips, and horse manure. And so anyway, that this this is the, like the right hand is the exact same bioreactor as you see in the left. And that's only, uh, that's in the middle of the summer. That's how well it breaks down. Um, it still takes a full year. Even though that looks like compost that you can use, and you can use it early, but you're short changing yourself. If you're in a pinch, you want to use it in six months, go ahead, but you're not getting the full spectrum of, of biology. And Dr. Johnson explains that in the interview I did with him in a YouTube live, why you want that of, of, to go a full year. Um, so anyway... We made our Johnson Sue in 2020. So in 2021, we're ready to apply. And I, uh, dad and I discuss how we want to do it. Um, and we had a difference of opinions on, I wanted to do cut nitrogen in half everywhere and eliminate FOSS on, on everything. And dad was okay with eliminating FOSS. I don't know why he, but he, I got him on that one, but he was like, no, we're not cutting back nitrogen anywhere. And I said, let, well, give me five acres. So he gives me five acres um, and we did three five acre test strips. So the whole field got 180 pounds of nitrogen and no FOSS. On our test strips, we had test strip A where we got 180 pounds of nitrogen and 40 pounds of FOSS. So this is the only strip that got FOSS and it was the nitrogen was the same on this strip as it was everywhere else in the rest of the field. And so we, that that's test strip A and we came up with test strip A because that's what our agronomist said that we needed to hit our yield goals of 200 plus bushel corn if, if it rained 
um, what we what our county average is and for what we're, our irrigating purposes are. So test strip B uh, had no nitrogen, no FOSS, because I wanted to see how effective it was in, it, you know, in doing it. And then test strip C had 90 pounds of nitrogen and no FOSS. So in all of these are eight gallons an acre of extract in furrow. Uh, to make an extract, I have a machine called the Bio5 machine. We have YouTube videos on that as well. But basically what you want to do is you want to put you know, if I'm doing 500 gallons of uh, to make, if I'm going to make 500 gallons of extract is, and that's what we make when we're making stuff in furrow, we'll take 120 pounds of compost. We'll put it our, in our extractor. It extracts for 20 minutes. And then, so we, once we have that extracted, we run more water through it and fill up the, the 500 gallon tank. And so that is giving us a ratio of one pound for of compost for four gallons of water and we're doing eight gallons an acre in furrow so this particular test strip did not have any seed treatment on the on the seed and it didn't have um it didn't have any foliar application later on this is just one treatment of johnson sue in furrow when we're planting so test strip b had the eight gallons test strip c had the the 90 pounds of nitrogen and eight gallons, neither B or C got any phosphorus and we didn't put any phosphorus anywhere on our farm um, on the on the corner of the Milo in 2021. So in 2022 or so in that year we did Milo or we did our wheat had phosphorus, but this year in 2022, we didn't apply any phosphorus on any of our farm ground. So this is what it looks like, and this is this is why the biology is so important, and this is why it's important to move off of synthetic fertilizer. So if you look at the corn on the right, and uh, that is the corn that got the uh, full rate of nitrogen and phosphorus, you look at the corn, sorry, I said right, I'm, I'm saying it wrong. The, the corn that looks taller out of the ground and has a crappy root structure, the one on the left, that's the one that got nitrogen and phosphorus. The one on the right, that has the deeper root system. If you look at the soil, you can even see the soil is darker on that on those spots, which blows my mind that the soil is dark, darker just in that one treatment. But you can see also that it's lacking the nitrogen to have the, the full explosion. So you need to think of it in terms of it's like ni synthetic nitrogen and synthetic phosphorus is like giving your corn crack or meth. It puts all the energy into growing the plant immediately, but that plant is devoid of other macronutrients like manganese, zinc, copper, iron, like whatever you're not putting out. It's not going to have it because it put all of its energy into growing up immediately. The other plants are putting all their energy and putting out exudates, which are building aggregates, and those aggregates are building soil structure, and then it's creating a rhizosheath sheath around your, your corn and so when we see the, the beautiful rise of sheaths that we'll see later on in my presentation, like that's a system that's taking place that is healthy that you have to have if you're going to heal your system. If you keep putting phosphorus into your system, you're going to hinder the root exudate development and you're not going to have aggregates. So if a plant has to put out secrete the exudates to attract mycorrhizal fungus and bacteria and, and other funguses, the saprophytic funguses that are developed in the Johnson Sioux, they have to have those funguses and bacteria to bring the plant the macro and micronutrients it needs. So it needs manganese, copper, zinc, iron, boron, all, all the macronutrients. It needs all those. It, you do not get that with synthetic phosphorus and synthetic nitrogen because it takes all the energy and take, put boiling those up. And then it does not secrete exudates. And so then the plant can't get them from the the uh, from the phos. I'm sorry, the plant can't get the the other macronutrients um, from the soil that it needs to have a healthy plant. And so that's why the Johnson Sioux is is extremely necessary in these systems. And that's this is why it he heals the systems, and this is why it works. So if you look at this this uh, test strip here, so on the right, I love doing presentations and saying which one had was was test strip a and which one's test strip b and the crowd is never in full agreement and this is it's funny because i i kind of didn't wasn't paying attention that much as during the growing season until i started to tassel and then it dawned on me i'm like holy crap like 
the stuff that got no nitrogen and no phosphorus, like I, I can't tell. And so people would come out to the, the farm and I'd be like, hey, come with me and check this out. Like whether it was a seed salesman or agronomist or another farmer, and I'm like, check this out. And they're like, what am I looking at? And I'm, I would tell them, one side has 180 pounds of nitrogen, 40 pounds of phos. The other one has no nitrogen, no phos. And most people would not believe me. They would tell me I'm full of crap. They was lying or whatever. But I, I, I was just so excited, you know, during this this process. And so, um, I knew that we had something going on even before we we harvested it. So harvest rolls around, and we had a hundred the test strip A that had 180 pounds of nitrogen and 40 pounds of phos. If you go down the bottom, it was 238, uh, 238 bushels an acre. And then test strip B was only 200 bushels an acre. So on the corn prices from that year and with the corn prices this year, you would still be more profitable where you put down the full rate of nitrogen and the full rate of phos. And then you come down to the 90 pounds of nitrogen. We were four bushels an acre better where we didn't apply any phosphorus and we had a half rate of nitrogen and added the biology. And this is why the biology is so key. So we're $100 an acre more profitable with the Johnson & Sioux. And this is the problem I have as I've shared this and as this information has blown up my YouTube channel and people want me to speak at conferences because of this information. This information does ultimately not matter because your mindset is in the wrong place if you're excited about Johnson & Sioux compost because of all the money you're going to save. Your mindset needs to be, how can I have the healthiest crops possible? How can I have the healthiest soil possible? If that is your goal, then you're going to be successful because you're going to have healthy crops that people want to buy. You're going to have healthy soil that's going to produce healthy plants. But if your mindset is, is how can I raise the highest bushel and make the most money? Your mind is in the wrong area and you're not going to be as successful in regenerative agriculture because you're asking the wrong question. The question that you're asking and wanting to get to is, is how can I be the most pro profitable? The question you should be asking is, how can I be the most sustainable? And how can I have the healthiest soils and grow the healthiest plants? Because this generation wants to be buying organic whatever and regeneratively grown whatever. That's what they want. So if you're going down this path of wanting to provide your customer with what they desire, and what's going to be best for the environment and what's going to be best for your health and everybody else's health. That's when you're going to be successful. And that's the one thing that I, I wish I would have done a better job of, you know, in promoting this stuff in the beginning, because I'm, I'm wanting to get people all excited about doing this. And yet I feel like I'm doing a disservice because we're, we're, we're still promoting bushels. I'm still being, being the one that's champion how much money you're going to make. And <laughs> That can't be your ultimate goal, uh, in my opinion. So <clears throat> it isn't just us. Um, so if you guys watch, uh, and I'll, I'll try to remind Keith to get this in there too. Um, Corey Miller had a video made about what they're doing. It's probably the best shot video that, that shows Johnson Sue. It's got the best cinematography. It's got the best storytelling. And it just shows how, how much Johnson Sue's helped Corey Miller. That's a great video to watch. Um, and then Dr. Johnson's latest presentation, if you go to his page, he goes through a bunch of farmers who are doing this that have, have been successful. He talks about the guys in Ukraine, um, Clint Freeze and Luke Host in, uh, Illinois, um, bioag management is their company and they're killing it with what they're doing and what they're doing needs to be replicated across the United States. They have a local business where they make compost extracts. They take soil samples and they find out what you're lacking in your soils. So they make the extract, add the macro and micronutrients to their extracts, and they apply that in furrow when you're planting corn. But they did a test strip just to show the benefit of the, of the compost extract. And so all they're applying on these test strips is nitrogen and compost extract. All right. So on the if on the bottom it doesn't really track well with the, the green and the red um but if you're you're following that where they did 200 pounds of nitrogen they did not apply any compost extract so with 200 pounds of nitrogen they raised 252 bushels of corn where they did 150 pounds of nitrogen 
and the compost extract. And I believe they did eight gallons an acre in furrow as well, but they raised 263 bushels an acre. And then in, if you keep going to the right and following me on the bottom there, they had two or a hundred pounds of nitrogen. It was 37, 237 pounds. Uh, I mean, 200, I got to slow down. I get too excited about this stuff and I don't even know what I'm saying. So let's just start all over. Far right, 200 pounds of nitrogen yielded 252 bushels of corn, but that's with no extract. The next one had ex extract. So 150 pounds of nitrogen yielded 263 bushels an acre. The next one was 100 pounds of nitrogen, 237 bushels an acre. And then 50 pounds of nitrogen, 257 bushels an acre, zero, 223. So their most profitable was 50 pounds of nitrogen. And that follows what Dr. Christine Jones said in the webinar that you guys did either last, it was last summer or two summers ago. It's, I think it's been two years, but I've watched that webinar series with her multiple times. It's actually what gave me the idea for the nitrogen myth and the phosphorus problem that um, was on my YouTube channel. And so that's a great webinar series, but that matches what, what she said on that webinar series that you guys did with her. And so uh, 50 pounds of nitrogen was his most profitable setup. So I talk about this in a YouTube video from this year um, where we raised 207 bushel corn uh, in 2022 with that, in our test strips. And I go through all of our test strips, but my data wasn't all that conclusive because I did multiple test strips and I seen multiple results from all the stuff that we were doing. So <clears throat> how is this possible? We have more micronutrients and macronutrients in our soil than, than we realize. We make it impossible to harvest them in traditional agriculture, meaning when we put down synthetic phosphorus, when we till our soil, when we do all these things, we, tilling destroys the fungal communities and a lot of the bacterial communities. And then phosphorus hinders root exudates. So, like I said before, so you're really not getting what you need when in traditional agriculture, you need to be doing the, the five soil health principles and you need to be adding biologicals if you're in an area like me where it's really lacking. And so we have access to the macro and micronutrients in our soil when we do the soil health principles and, uh, and regenerative agriculture and we when we're using the BEAM approach. So BEAM stands for Biologically Enhanced Agricultural Method. <clears throat> when you this is a complete, or this is a total nutrition digestion report. I think I'm saying that right, that Regen Ag Labs does. And so uh, I sent off a soil sample to on all of our irrigated fields uh, to Regen Ag Labs. And that came back. And how they explained it to me is if you look here, we have uh, 3,336 pounds of nitrogen in our soil. That's organic nitrogen that's not plant available okay we have 1200 pounds of phosphorus available that's not available because it's tied up with all this jack ton of calcium that we have in our soil so depending on the ph level of your soil your phosphorus as soon as you put it out is going to get tied up in our soils it gets tied up with calcium so that's why we have a ton of calcium and phosphorus in our soils because we've been applying 40 pounds a year every single year that we're planting a cash crop and as soon as we apply it it's tied up 85 percent of it that's the other thing that drives me nuts about this whole farmers not being willing to give up phosphorus how many people would go to to an investor and say i want to invest my money and they're like oh, okay we're going to lose 85 percent right off the bat and you say great here you go here's my money like that, that's stupid. I don't know why we think that we have to be applying jack ton of phosphorus. If we do these tests, total nutrition digestion test, call Regen Ag's Ward Labs. They both do them and have the test done. If you have this much phosphorus in your soil, you don't need to be applying phosphorus. You need to be applying the biologicals that are going to get your plants access to it. So this is the equivalency of 5,000 pounds of mez. 5,000 pounds of mez is 130 years. When I made the phosphorus problem, the nitrogen myth video, people are like, oh, well, you're going to deplete it. You know, in a couple of years, you, you know, make a video in 10 years when you tell us what a failure you are because of this. I'm like, okay, well, I'll do that in 130 years and I'll tell my grandkids to make it and tell us what happened in 130 years when I have no phosphorus in 130 years. So 
that's why when we're applying the biologicals that it works. So let's get to the biologicals. Um, just for time, I'm going to skip this slide. So here's the nitrogen. This is the, I sent this test off to, um, I believe it's biomakers. So I have a YouTube video that, that I go over this test. And this was the big aha moment for me. This is when I understood why my Johnson Sioux was working so well. So this test showed they, we sent it off to do a DNA analysis on my compost. The DNA analysis on my compost showed I had 305 species of fungus and 367 species of bacteria in my compost. Of those 670 species, 83% of them made inorganic nitrogen or made organic nitrogen in a form that the plant could take it up. All right, we go over here to carbon. 61% of them fix carbon, meaning that they're they're taking um, atmospheric carbon and then getting that put back into the soil through the root exudate. So 61% of them do that. If I'm saying that wrong and, and somebody is liable to be like, hey, that you're wrong on that, go ahead and comment because I think that's right, but I'm open to being wrong. So next slide. Um, oh, I don't have that in there. Shoot. So the... On the next one, it shows down here, the uh, phosphorus and potassium, they're both 49%. So for you guys who are applying a ton of potash, you can, like, if you do that total nutrition digestion test and you, you find that you actually have the potash, then you're not, or potassium, then you're not going to be needing to apply potash. That's one of the most common questions I get is, is, you know, what do you do for potash? Are you not applying that anymore? Well, if you go back to this, I have 7,000 pounds of, of, of potassium in our soil. That's the value I have. So I don't have to worry about that either. We've never applied um, potash. So anyway, if you go down to phosphorus 49, potassium 49. So that's why I'm not needing to apply phosphorus anymore because I've got over 300 species of bacteria and fungus that I'm adding that are gonna access the tied up phosphorus in my soil and make it plant available. Um, so the things I want you guys to take away from this webinar is that you need to not be intimidated by the science of these things. I, I didn't understand exudates and aggregates in 2020. I didn't understand them at all. Didn't want to understand them. Didn't feel like I needed to understand them. And now that we have all the information that we have from Dr. Christine Jones, Dr. Elaine uh, Ingram, Ingham, I always say her last name wrong. Uh, Dr. David Johnson, Dr. James White, uh, Toby, Dr. Toby Kears. Like we have the information that we need to understand these things. And now that we know how much money we are saving because of these biologicals, there is no excuse for you to have whatever limiting factor that you have in your brain that tells you you can't acquire wisdom and knowledge and understanding to be able to understand some of these things. Like, there's no excuse for that. If I, if I can do it, anyone can do it. I, I, when I watch a YouTube video, if I don't know what they're saying, I write down what the word is that I don't know what they're saying. Then I go do a Google search, read about it. And then I go back and watch the video again. That takes a long time. It's tedious. And most people's mindset is I want to watch as many stuff, many things as possible. What good does it do you to watch or to like John Kemp's a great example. I go through too many of those podcast when I should just listen to the one podcast, write down all the stuff I don't understand, go find out what it is and go back to that one. If I can teach somebody else and if I can understand it well enough to teach somebody else, then I have it. But if I just listen to that, that podcast that he has with Nicole Masters and I walk away from it or Jay Fuhrer or any of the good, like he did one with Dale, it was really good too. If I go away from those without understanding what I just heard or what I just learned, like it does me no good. Okay, so we want to be a people that are acquiring wisdom and knowledge and understanding. You need to start your Johnson Sioux this year. Okay, and then you got to decide if you want to start it or, or buy it because there's a bunch of places where you can buy compost as good as Johnson Sioux or actually buy the Johnson Sioux. And then there's huge opportunities for you to save money, kind of like what we already talked about with how much money we're saving. And there's huge opportunities to add revenue to your farm. So um, hopefully we can get some of this stuff for you on the, we're going to be putting way too many notes. It's like system overload, but these are the scientists that I like to follow. Uh, I've learned a lot of what I know now, especially from Dr. James White and what he's doing at Rutgers. Um, 
Dr. Toby Kears, I listen to her stuff this summer. And so I've been trying to get people aware of, of what she's doing and some of the stuff she's doing. I haven't heard anybody else doing any kind of research, even similar to what she's doing. And it's amazing what she's discovered. Um, so other people, uh, doctor, and then I, I put her out there because I know a lot of people that have gotten a lot of stuff from her. I haven't been studying her as much as I should because my focus is on Johnson's two compost and she does a thermal aerobic pile and, and there's turning involved. And I was going to learn that last year. And then I realized I, I need to make sure I know my ingredients well in Johnson Sioux. And I want to test some other things on, on ingredients on Johnson Sioux. So I just get that. So I think that there's a, a point there too, where you got to decide which avenue you're going to go and what you're going to do. But if you, I, I would go ahead and watch her videos and decide which type of compost you want to make, because Dr. Uh, her, her, Elaine Ingham's method, she, where she turns, it's ready way quicker than Johnson Sioux. doesn't have the fungal count, uh, but it's got, it actually has more, from what I've understand, it's got more protozoa in it, uh, the way you do it that way. For the Love of Soils, I highly recommend this book. I'm having my 11-year-old son read it right now. Uh, John Kemp's podcast um, and his YouTube channel, um, that's Advancing Eco Agriculture. That's great stuff. Uh, Jay Fuhr, uh, Ken Hamilton, Green Cover Seeds, like all, all these are great resources. Acquire wisdom and knowledge and don't stop learning. Don't ever arrive and think, oh, I've got it now and I'm going to have a system now. Don't don't want a system want to be learning what the, like to get a better system every single time. Um, the biggest problems we have is our mind. So some of you guys that are watching this, it doesn't work. It's not possible. The problem that you have is you're not humble enough to learn and, and to want to, to question whether or not something is possible. And that's something that I've, I've tried to do with myself is, you know, if anybody challenges me or, or, or says that I'm wrong in something, I want to consider what they're saying. I don't want to just automatically dismiss them and say that they're wrong because they challenged me. Like, who am I to say that, that I have all the answers? And that's the thing I love about Dr. David Johnson is, is he's really humble. Uh, it, uh, Nicole Masters mentions in her book when she was with him. He's not offering information about, you know, how smart he is and everything he's learned when he's around other people. He's quiet and asks questions and wants to learn. And he's a scientist that is brilliant and is doing a lot of amazing things. You know, if we're going to be people who are acquiring wisdom and knowledge, we need to be along the lines like him, keeping our mouth shut and asking questions and learning, regardless of how how wise we are and how much information that we have to offer. Um, so I'm going to skip that part because we're running out of time. But I talk about the five soil health principles. Um you know, and the, the understanding the five soil health principles, like everything the five soil health principles is doing is keeping the microbial life alive. So you need to understand the microbial life better uh, for the love of soils has an entire chapter on the microbial life within your soil. So I encourage you guys reading that and understanding why you want to be keeping these populations and these, these, um, all, all these, my, um, all these microorganisms and keeping them alive. Um, so the thing that you need to ask yourself right now is, is like, do I want to do Johnson Sue? If you want to do Johnson Sue, you're going to save yourself a lot of money. Um, so my encouragement to you guys is, is watch like from this summer on, watch all my YouTube videos. Don't watch the stuff I made in 2020. I really didn't know what I was talking about. I was just super excited and wanting to get the information out there. So watch my YouTube videos from this summer and beyond, um, or I don't know, there's some good stuff in 2021. <laughs> 2020 was just not a great year. Uh, make uh, make four different ones, at least, a minimum of four Johnson Sioux bioreactors, all with different ingredients, so you can see what breaks down the best and is going to be the best to do. And I really encourage you, watch a bunch of Dr. Johnson's stuff and write it down and then rewatch it because... I, I was in his presentation. I watched his videos multiple times. I watched other videos and I still made mistakes. So make sure that you're, you're, you know, if you're a passionate person like me and you're excited and ready to go, don't, don't think that you're not going to make mistakes. You're, you're going to make mistakes. And then the next thing that you need to question is, is do I have the stomach to learn all this stuff? And if you don't, then there's some great places to purchase it. You know, we all have to be able to know what our limitations are and what our time limitations are. You're not limited by your understanding your brain. There's information out there that you can get it. It's just, do you have the time to make Johnson Sue? And if you don't, or you want to just purchase it, there's some really affordable products out there that you can purchase. 
So where you can buy it, you can buy it from Fed and Happy, Soil Works, Elevate Ag, Dave West, or Don Lori. Okay. Fed and Happy is not Johnson Sue. He's got a, a composting system that's similar. Um, and his is very affordable. Soil Works has, I think, 40 different strands of fungus in it. So there's less fungal counts on the Soil Works, but there's a lot of humic and fulvic acid in Soil Works' product. So it's a great product. Elevate Ag has a great product that's already in liquid form that you don't have to make an extract, but it's more expensive. David West and Don Laurie are both making Johnson Sioux compost that they are selling. All right. So those are places that I recommend to buy Johnson Sioux compost. If you buy biologicals from anywhere else, you have to ask these questions. What is in your product? If they just tell you it's full of microbes, Ask the next question, what is the fungal to bacterial ratio in your product and how many living fungus and bacterial organisms are in your product? Are they currently living? Are they active? They're, if, they're, if they're selling a jug, unless they're Elevate Ag and, and, and We Grow With, unless they're those companies and they're working together, I don't know anybody that has living fungus in a jug. I don't think, I think Ryan Noss is the only one I, I'm aware of right now that has cracked that code. So ask the right questions when you're buying a product that isn't from one of these five companies. So I've, I, I trust those companies like everyone else. Like I'm sure there's other great companies out there, but there's a lot of people who will tell you they're selling you a, a, a product that has active uh, biology in it. And then you ask them what the fungus bacteria ratio is. Oh, it has two strands of fungus in it. Oh, it has seven strands of, I'm sorry, it has two strains of bacteria in it, two. Or they'll say that it has seven strains of bacteria in it. None of them will say they have fungus in it because they don't have fungus in it. And then some of them will be like, oh, great question. These are just the enzymes secreted by the bacteria and the fungus. And here's the thing, their product works because the plant, like because of quorum sensing, and you, I encourage you to go search out and find out what quorum sensing is. It gives the signals to the, the seed and it works, but you're not adding the fungus and bacteria that you need long-term, you know, to heal your soils. So make sure you're asking the right questions and that you're, you're, that they're, they're a company that has live biology in it. And if they're not, they're probably more expensive than one of these companies. And if they're more expensive than one of these companies, then why are you buying their product? So there's an opportunity for you to save. Um, like I said already, stop applying phosphorus. With what we've cut back, we farm about 8,000 acres. Um, we don't plant every single acre every every year. Uh, but what we've saved in our our bill on 8,000 acres this last year was, was over $200,000 between nitrogen and phosphorus and savings on that. So that's a huge savings for your farming operation. Um, so... There's the opportunity to save there on cutting back. I, I recommend you not being crazy like me and just cutting it all back all at once. Like you can eliminate your phosphorus, but but you need to be hesitant on how much you reduce your your nitrogen. You I would keep some of your fields the full rate of nitrogen. I would do some of your fields half, and I would do some of your fields a quarter, or do multiple fields where there's multiple test strips. Uh, but really think about that as you're going. Um, the opportunities to, to make money are out there on making compost on a large scale or buying compost from some of these companies where it's really affordable, making your own extracts and getting it to the local farmer. Um, this is Don Laurie sell, set up. And then David West, I don't know what his setup's like, but David West sells large scale Johnson's too. So um, this is this is a picture of, of him. Um, building his setup, Don Laurie, and he's in um, Arkansas, the north part of Arkansas. Um, but as they, this is what the finished one looks like, and that this is what it looks like finished. But this is them building that that same setup that you saw on the screen before. And this, I think he told me this cost le a less than a thousand bucks. It was just bending these, these cow panels around and having a frame on the top and then lining it like with the, that, I think that's plastic, like for what you're making a hoop house or uh uh, oh, uh uh what do you call those gardens that i'm drawing a blank you know what i'm talking about but yeah so anyway um this is what dan's uh setup is like that this is dan's pretty amazing and it's gonna be hard to beat fed and happy because they have this setup 
So this is this setup is in Hutchison, Kansas. This is an old Cessna building full of it's 5,000 tons of compost. And then he has a way of, of, of straining that compost to where it's a really fine product in the end. Um, so, I mean, it's going to be tough to build, I mean, to, to compete with them as far as what they've created. Um, but, you know, you want to be thinking on that, on those, those terms. Uh, if you go to bio, oh gosh, between bio ag, yeah, it's bio ag management. So that's Clint Freeze's company. So Clint's the one um, who I did that talked about the test trips earlier, Clint set up. And I have a YouTube video about this, but Clint setup is they make the compost extract and they add, you know, the micro and macronutrients that, that the, the, you know, the Haney test says that they need, and then they make scripts for their farmers and then they take it out. I mean, they're crushing it on how much money they're making doing that. And for you guys who are watching this, like Johnson Sue's not difficult to make composting is not difficult to get into and if you can make a simple hoop house like what don's making then you can be you know cleaning people's like what we're going to do is we're going to clean some wheat seed for people and then we're going to apply johnson sue on it so we're getting paid for to clean the wheat seed and we're getting paid to, to clean you know to apply the johnson sue you know and that's the things you guys got to think about as farmers is what revenue sources can i be bringing into the operation because I mean, by my calculations, it's somewhere between ten thousand and twelve thousand dollars per bioreactor if we charge a dollar fifty for treating wheat seed. And so, I mean, like there, there's a lot of opportunity out there for people to be making money. I, I don't know what the math is. It's it's not quite that much if you're making an extract in furrow for um, if you're charging what Clint Freeze charges, which is twenty bucks an acre for the extract. You know they're they're closer to I think that six thousand dollar range range revenue by the 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 compost, but there's still money to be made even if you don't want to make the compost because you can buy it from Don David or or Fed and Happy or Soil Works, and then apply you know make an extract and apply you know and sell that extract to farm farmers. So there's huge opportunities there for you guys to make money. Um, I don't really talk I didn't talk about the con the extraction process in this presentation, but that's on my my page and I'm hopefully going to make an, an extractor on our farm so that I can teach people how to make an extractor uh, because soil works makes a great extractor that we have. And I think they're a year and a half out on how many people are wanting to buy their extractors. So um, that concludes my, my presentation for you guys. And I'm excited to get into you guys' questions and answers. All right. Well, thank you, Jay. That was, that was very, very, very nice. Um, yeah. We have a lot of questions to get to here. So um just trying to <clears throat> uh you kind of alluded to the fact that you do uh, apply it to the seed so Jer jeremiah here is asking about um have you done any on like um he's talking about seedlings uh, alfalfa seedlings do you have any tips of applying to small seeded um yeah so i think you would want to get like a a sprayer pump that you could carry around your farm and, and spot spray weeds. Um, you'd want to get an extract and make an extract for that. So um, soil works as extractor is really good for that, but you're going to have to find a way to strain. I don't have them, but the, the, I mean, if you look online, there's those mesh bags that are like 50 mesh bags. You can put compost in that and dip it in a bucket. And as long as you got uh, you got that strained well where it's going to go through a, a spray system, you know, you, you can you can be applying it to your seeds that way. Keith, have you guys done anything like that with, with seed treatment? Or you know anybody else that, that has done alfalfa seeds? Uh, not a lot. I mean, we, we do pretty small seeds in our seed blenders. Um, and we can pump liquid up in there, but it has already been filtered many times before it gets to us. So yeah, the, the key is just going to be in, in really, really good filtration. Okay, yeah. Um, another question here uh, from Doug. Uh, will uh, Johnson Sue eliminate fungicides? Have you have any experience with that, Jay? Um, maybe in a seed treatment or just overall throughout the growing season? Um, does he mean like, 
so you got to think about it's two, com two completely different things. So like fungicides killing funguses and um, the beam is, is adding funguses. So, you know, if you go back and look at that, that picture that I had on my screen, um, it, um, both those seeds had, were, were treated. So, you know, you're killing some of the biology with the, the seed treatment, but the, the biology that you're adding is so strong that your plant's still having a response. We're, we have a problem with some kind of a worm. I'm guessing it's a wireworm or something that's eating our corn seed before. Um, you know, I, I've done Jimmy Red in 2020. Uh, in 2022, we did a non-treated uh, GMO corn. So it was a GMO corn, but it wasn't treated. And I bet we had a 50% uh, stand. Like it was, it was terrible. And it, it, and I, I, that was like on four acres. So that, that really hurt um, where we were trying to see if we can get by with non-treated seed. So uh, Elevate Ag has a product that I've been talking to, um, to them about um, called, uh, what's well, chitin. And I, I think it's chitin or, or I can't pronounce the name of, of the, the product that they're selling. Chitin. You know yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of, so it. like I'm I'm planning on using that product to see if that helps out. Um, but we don't have any seed treatment on our, 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 our fungicide on our wheat for that purpose because I want to be feeding that biology. And so you want to start it, it, examining ways to get rid of the fungicide treatments on on your on your seeds. Okay. Uh thank you for that. Uh, Marlon is asking, uh, when do you when do you add the worms to your bioreactor? A great question. So you want to have a thermometer and test the temperatures. Your bioreactors are going to get, um, you know, hopefully get up to that 150 range. Could get a little bit hotter. Um, Dr. Johnson told me that he had one that was 160, I think, for 18 days. And so, like, they can stay pretty hot for a long time. Um, but, yeah, you want a thermometer. Once it gets down to 80 degree, degrees, you can add your worms and fed and happy cells the 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 red wiggler composting worms and i right now i only have uh earthworms um and so i'm going to be adding the fed and happy worms and according to dan they they live together in harmony and so i wouldn't i wouldn't have a problem using both worms in your system okay another question here um typically from dan typically how many gallons can you expect from one extractor so there's 600 uh, pounds. They 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 say roughly, and I'm going to try to weigh my my compost um, to our compost to to see what they what they weigh and how they're breaking down. Um, so anyway, the once if you think 600, then it's going to make 1,200 gallons of extract, and so. On a full year, you want to be applying 20 gallons an acre. On a full year, you want to do eight gallons an acre, um, you know, in furrow. And Dr. Johnson on that farm that he did with turkey, they were 20 gallons an acre, but they were only one pound for that 20 gallons. So his extract doesn't is biologically is going to have less for the amount of water it's in, but he still was successful with that. And I'm guessing I probably need to, to play with how much, you know, and cut back and, and see if I can get as much results with one pound of compost for eight gallons instead of two pounds for eight gallons. Okay. And I, I think here's a good question to maybe follow up with that. How many applications of the Johnson Sioux do you typically do in a year? Um, is it just on the seed? Is it in furrow two or foliar, what's kind of your method? Uh, that's a great question. So most of it is all one. Um, this year it's going to be more on our, uh, with our corn, because on the irrigated stuff, we're going to do it in furrow. Uh, probably going to do a seed treatment beforehand as well. And then we're probably going to fertigate with <clears throat> nitrogen. We're going to build a fertigation system. And once we get that fertigation system going, then we're going to actually add um, we're going to actually add compost extract as well. Okay. Okay. Um, Andrew here is asking, um, uh, the importance of local fungal or bacterial or bacteria in your compost compared to buying a commercially, uh, a commercially made compost. So, you know, products or, um, uh, materials from your own farm versus maybe buying it from, from somewhere else that's making it with other materials. Uh, Andrew, that's a great question. And there's a lot of 
inconsistency out there as to what people will say. Um, so Zach Wright, who I respect a lot, and Ryan Noss, who I respect a lot, are, are on the, the idea of share as much compost from different areas as possible, and your soil gets to decide what's going to live. And I, I've heard that from I, Ken Hamilton, I think, was the one that was talking about it, but he was talking about foliar applications and that when you do a foliar application of Johnson Sioux and you picture that biology falling on the leaves um, of the of the leaf of the of the plant, the plant as it secretes exudates um, to feed that biology actually feeds the biology that it wants to keep alive and allows what it wants to come into st the stomata of the leaf. As far as I understand it, so having a, a diverse amount of biology is better because the plant knows what it needs and it feeds it. Now that's for the stomata. I don't know the way it works within the the rhizosphere and. Um, I do know on Toby Kears's research, she was pointing out that the plant, it's either the plant or the, I think it's the, the plant. So the plant knows, sorry, I got to rewatch. See, I got to watch the video again. But anyway, I, one of the two of those. So like either the, I think it's, maybe it is the biology, but anyway, the, the, but I think one of the two of them, like the plant will secrete and feed the biology that is going to or no, that that's what it is. So the plant, the if you have a multi-species cover crop, the fungus and bacteria knows which plant is is secreting the most carbon from its 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 soil and what's going to feed it the most. And so they'll discriminate between which root systems they want to bring micronutrients to one another. But with the mycorrhizal fungus, those plants can share the micronutrients amongst themselves within that. Now go watch that video from Toby Kears and find out what part of that I misremembered, but there's, there's something crazy going on there with her research. That's just really, really awesome. I yeah, get pretty in depth with some of that, that biology for sure. Um, Molly here is asking, um, says, since the compost weight is highly dependent on moisture, how do you measure moisture content? On, uh, on that's a great question. I should have asked Dr. Johnson on that because he was saying like, if you grab it and squeeze it, you know, it'll be so many drops of moisture um, coming off of, off of your finger and our fingers on your knuckles. The way I do it is, is I watch the bioreactors and I go by his rule of one gallon, oh, excuse me, one gallon um, per day on each bioreactor. But once you get the water coming out the bottom, like one gallon's too much. So I just cut back based on that. And right now I'm down to where I'm, I'm watering every other day. And it's, it's basically, I, I water on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been trying to find on my computer here, uh, the presentation where I show the video of, of us applying it onto the seed, but I'm going to keep looking while you guys are asking questions. But I think the best way to do that would be to, I can't remember who's telling me this. I'm going to have to I talk to him. I think it was Corey Miller, but he was saying we should be just measuring the, the moisture content. And there's a way to do that. Uh, there's a there's some kind of uh, something that you can measure moisture content. So if you can find something that measures moisture content, that's the best way to do it is make sure it's 70 percent moisture by volume all around your bioreactor. And that's that's the easiest way. OK, um, I think. You know, we're, we're past one o'clock here, but uh, Jay, we still have some questions to go. So if, if you're okay, yeah, I'm with, fine. Uh, continue to answer a few questions. Um, Norman here is uh, asking about the variability of the Johnson Sioux and what experience you have with that. Um, I don't know, maybe if you want to allude, I know you've taken some B crop tests on your Johnson Sioux. Have, have you done that multiple times to see if there's any vari variability in that or? So... Yeah. Oh, so it's like from, from when I'm taking the B crop or do you understand that Dylan? Like, is she saying at what point that the, that that's taken or just like through the season or, or on just on different. I'm, I'm guessing the way I'm understanding is maybe on, on different types of, uh, you know, from, from one reactor to the next. So you made this mix and then you made this mix and then you made this mix. Yeah. So the year that we did that, it wasn't a B crop. It was the full one. And the full one's like 400 bucks. Okay. If you just do the, and, and I think the way to understand that is, is if you do the $400 one, 
you're basically testing it three times and it's and that's like you're doing that so you can sell it commercially and you okay. have the competence to say what is is in my Johnson Sioux. If you just do the B crop, it's only doing time. And I think that's what I'm going to do going forward. Um, but the problem with the B crop is, is it's only giving you the fungus and bacteria species. So if you think of Johnson's Sioux as you have like mine, I had more bacteria species, but my, according to Dr. Johnson, he believes that my fungus populations were way higher than that. And so it's not a, a good assessment of how much life you actually have in there because it, it could be like, you know, if you just picture it as something like, you know, sheep and cows, right? I may have, you know, five different uh, breeds of, 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 of cows and I've got 20 breeds, different breeds of sheep. But then I actually, in my field, in my whole pasture, I might have twice as many cattle as I do sheep, but the, the, the difference of species is there's less on the cattle. And that's the way you kind of need to think of that Johnson Sioux test I did. And so that's why the B crop is a little bit limited because it's only giving you the difference of bacteria and fungus species that are within your compost. You're not getting a total count. Um, and so I think you need to know how to do my cross B uh, to be able to get that count. Um, and so you can take courses, you can take Elaine uh, Ingram's course, uh, that's not something I'm interested in doing right now, just because, uh, that's, it, it's great information and it would be handy to know, but there's about eight other things I'm doing right now with our farm that are brand new things for me. And I, I've, I've got to be able to limit what I can put on my plate and, and do in, in amount of time. Okay. Um, so another question from, uh, from Harry here, where, where do you get the extractors from to, uh, Great question. So uh, Bio5 makes a great extractor. The one problem with the Bio5 is it's meant to, to clean out the Bio5 product. It's not meant to clean out Johnson Sioux that has a lot of unbroken down wood chips in it. So when you clean that out, you're going to plug it up if you just open the valve on the bottom. What Corey Miller does is he's, he's got a screen that he scoops it out of the bottom first. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, if you have the Bio5 machine, it's made for um, the bio five product, which is a great product. And it's still a great machine, but if you're putting Johnson Sioux in there, you either need to screen it beforehand and screen the bigger wood chips out, out of that, and then put your compost in, which is a tedious product, or you need to look into making your, a new extractor. I'm going to, I'm looking into making a new extractor. Um, what's his face is, uh, gosh, Clint freeze with bioag management, who I've mentioned three times now, Clint's got an amazing extractor, but it's, I think they're up to like $25,000 on their cost. And it's great for bigger farms. And if you're covering, you know, if you're covering as many acres as I'm covering, it's worth, the, it's worth the $30,000 check that you're writing to that because you're going to save, you know, the $200,000 in input. So what, what do you care about a 30 or $25,000 machine? So um, that, that's the one way to think about it. And then if you search uh, compost extractors, you're going to find something that works. You're just going to have to put a little time and research into to finding it. And that's how I've gotten my idea for mine. We'll get it made. We'll see how it works. And if it works great, great. If it doesn't, then it won't. And then there's a company that I'm working with, with possibly demoing their, th their product or their extractor to see if it's going to be an extractor that I, I want to recommend to people to use. Okay. Okay. Um, Emily here asks, um, so if all those hundreds of species of fungi grow in the Johnson Sioux, then they must have been on the materials that went into the compost on day one. So why does it take the special compost to grow? them? Great question. Uh, yes and no. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of fungal spores in the air at any given time. And I just said that, and I'm not 100% sure of the actual number. So I may be exaggerating. I may be under, but there's lots and lots of fungal spores flowing through the air. So when you think about those fungal spores flowing through the air, like you're going to have fungal spores land in your Johnson Sioux. So mycorrhizal fungus cannot grow in Johnson Sioux because mycorrhizal fungus needs a living root to grow. But Dr. Johnson has found mycorrhizal fungus spores in his Johnson Sioux because those spores landed in his compost. And also, once he applied the compost to his ground or, to, or to, in their test strips, 
they it, they had 20 new species of mycorrhizal fungus in their soil. So what that that told them was is that the adding of the the Johnson Sioux compost to your soil, even though it's full of saprophytic funguses that break plants down, it actually created an environment that that mycorrhizal fungus could flourish once those fungal spores landed back into your soil. So um, that's that's one of the reasons why um, when you're doing Johnson Sioux that you want it to grow an entire year because you're going to be adding, you know, more and more fungal populations. When you add the worms, there's going to be the fungal component from their gut biome and the bacteria gut deal. So like when you add your worms, you're going to be adding new microbiology to your system because the, the worm's gut is just one of the most fantastic things in the world because it's adding, it's adding a ton of micronutrients to your soil, but it's also adding a ton of the the bacteria and fungus and other like worm castings are full of nematodes as well. So like it's just a huge benefit to it. So that's one of the reasons why you, when you think of Johnson Sioux, you want it to go an entire year because it's adding the biology over time from the fungal spores coming into it. Okay. I think we'll, we'll go for one more question here, Jay, and uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, you, you alluded to the fact in your presentation about how the biology um, you know, correlates with all the soil health principles. Don here asks, what difference has the cows made for you on your operation? Um, so that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we've seen dung beetles come back. Um, I found one two years ago and this year I found six. And so I'm excited to see how much that population continues to, to increase. Um, you think about their gut biome it's, it's the same thing they're adding the microbiology from their gut biome um you know you can heal these systems naturally with cattle with rotational grazing with cover crops and all that stuff our our problem is is that our ground is so depleted of micro or the uh, so depleted of the biology um you think about i not, uh nicole masters talks about this in her book for the love of soils um, and then she mentioned this at the conference I was at with her, but she, and we really talked about it at that conference a lot, but uh, kochia and pigweeds are two weeds that we fight terribly here. Neither one of them have a relationship with mycorrhizal fungus. So if there is a large population of mycorrhizal fungus, you're putting them in a position where they're not in a healthy situation for the, the fungus and bacteria. Also synthetic nitrogen, like those two those plants love synthetic nitrogen and they love large amounts of it so you when you're adding the synthetic nitrogen you're you're creating an environment that those plants love um whereas you know you're you add this biology back and you're able to bring back the populations of um you know your saprophytic funguses but also the mycorrhizal funguses you're able to create an environment that's not conducive to the pigweed and the kochia. So to answer your question for us, the, the cattle have been great and I love the biology, but the biggest changes in our farm have come from Johnson's too. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, they're all pieces. If you're going to till the crap out of your ground and, you know, adding the synthetic fertilizer, then Johnson Sioux is not going to benefit you as much as if you have a system where you have the cattle, you have no till, you have armor on the soil, you have the diversity of species, like all these things are, you know, working together, you know, and the idea is, is keeping the biology alive. And so anything you can do to keep biology alive, the better off your system is going to be in the long term. Okay. Well, Jay, uh, thank you, and and on behalf of Green Cover, we appreciate you taking time out of your your schedule to to have this webinar with us. Um, I want to thank everybody else for attending, and uh, remember to you know if you have any more questions on the extractor or building it, uh, Jay has a lot of videos um, kind of explaining how he builds them in his process, so you can check that out on his YouTube page. Is it Young Red Angus, right, Jay? Yeah, and I, I haven't built one yet, but we're gonna build one this year. And then I've got I've got stuff on the, you know, the bio five extractor. If you look at that extractor, I mean, a, a smart. I'm not very good at building things, and I, I feel like somebody who knows how to build stuff can see the bio five extractor and be like, oh yeah, I could build one. So you know, like if you do research on YouTube, you're gonna find a way to 
build an extractor. If that intimidates you, overwhelms you, you don't want to do it, then pay the extra money to have the Elevate Ags product that has the, the foundational fungus in it that has mycorrhizal fungal spores in it. So even if you're even if you're wanting to build your Johnson Soup piles, I would recommend using that foundational fungi as a product in the beginning. And then right before you apply your Johnson Soup, adding a little bit of that because you're going to be adding the mycorrhizal fungal component. Okay. Yeah. And, and I know we didn't get to all the questions. Um, we, don't, we, we will try to answer as many of them as we can. Um, we'll also have this webinar posted on our YouTube page, as, along with all of our other webinars for you to go back and review later. Um, and next week you can join us. We'll uh, next week, Wednesday, same time. Um, we'll be having another webinar with Elevate Ag and some customers and some testimonials uh, that, that they have. So again, Jay, thank you. Appreciate it. And everybody yeah. Well, that was a good transition then with Elevate Ag mentioning their product. So yeah, watch next week to hear about Elevate Ag. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, y'all have a good day then. Thank All you. All right, thanks a lot, man.